Okay, I'd like to uh, just start off by thanking um, Henri and Serge for the very kind invitation to the summer school. Uh, thanks to the organizing committee as well, and, and thanks to a very attentive audience. I've been watching you, and you all seem to be um, really awake and alert, which is great, and I hope uh, that goes for my presentation too. We've already had a, a, a wonderful uh, introduction to dual reasoning processes and multiple reasoning processes uh, in the form of Jonathan Evans' uh, talk. Um, and I think it, I fall centrally within uh, the framework that Jonathan was talking about. Um, Jonathan mentioned in his talk that dual processes in reasoning really have a sort of fairly modest uh, start in the history of reasoning research in the sort of gestalt tradition. Uh, and then I think it's true to say that really the sort of pioneering work on dual reasoning processes commenced with Peter Wason. Uh, in the 1970s and um, his research in London, along with Jonathan Evans and their colleagues at that time. Those were the early beginnings of the dual process theory, the type 1, type 2 distinction in reasoning, that have now, as we've seen, uh, burgeoned uh, in the literature with most um, international reasoning laboratories conducting research on dual processes and with the popularity really uh, being showcased in, in Daniel Kahneman's 2011 uh, book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. And I think it's also true to say that from those fairly modest beginnings of dual process theory, we're now seeing dual process ideas uh, emerging in, in a lot of the literature on higher, higher cognition, uh, in judgment and decision making, as well as reasoning, but also in areas such as problem solving and creativity um, as well, which is exciting to see. Uh, in terms of the aims of my presentation, just to give you a bit of a road map as to where I'm heading, um, I'll start off by overviewing some key concepts associated with dual process theory, DPT for, thought, uh, for short, the dual process theory of reasoning, really linking very closely to what Jonathan mentioned in his talk uh, in relation to the sort of um, standard dual process framework, uh, really relating to the Evans and Stanovich 2013 uh, paper published in Perspectives on Psychological Science. In that paper, um, Evans and Stanovich really were addressing some of the key criticisms that have been lodged against dual process theory by many critics out there. Um, and I will also look at some of those key criticisms. Jonathan talked about some of them in his talk. Um, I'll pull out a few key ones that I think are relevant to the um, ongoing discussion that I'll present in relation to belief bias effects in, in reasoning. Particular criticisms that I'll focus in, focus in on are those to do with the testability and falsifiability of dual process theory, since I think that's absolutely fundamental to get to grips with. And what I'll try and show is that I think dual process theories of belief bias as a particular reasoning phenomena, phenomenon do have um, testable predictions uh, that can allow for falsification of theories and theory development. And in talking about belief bias, uh, both as a phenomenon and in terms of the theories that are out there, um, I'll really try and show how over the last 30 years we've uh, had some major theoretical advancements in dual process theory, idea, theory ideas and concepts uh, that have come from looking at testable predictions and from um, adding in uh, assumptions to theories to explain the full raft of uh, belief bias data that's out there. I look at uh, what I call sequential dual process theories and Jonathan talked a little bit about the default interventionist kind of paradigm. That's very much a sequential dual process theory where Processing moves from some intuitive default response towards some more reflective decision making and judgment. I'll also look at uh, parallel dual process theories. Uh, again, Jonathan mentioned those um, as exemplified by Sloman's work, where the intuitive and the reflective streams of processing operate in parallel, uh, which leads to some interesting ideas. And then I'll finish off. Uh, by looking at some more hybrid approaches to dual process theorizing, again in the context of belief bias. Uh, hybrid pro approaches that sort of pick up on notions of dual processing and of some kind of sequential 
processing as well. And I think we probably need these kind of richer, uh, more hybrid theories um, in order to really encompass the, the breadth of data that's out there in relation to phenomena like belief bias. I'll then finish off by reviewing some of the limitations of current dual process theories of belief bias and talk a little bit about some potential future directions in the area. So that's the sort of roadmap. So I'll start off by looking at the Evans and Stanovich uh, sort of received view, as Jonathan called it, of dual process theory, which really looks at these sort of clusters of attributes that frequently go together in relation to either type one intuitive processing on the one hand or type two more reflective processing on the other hand. And what Evans and Stanovich um, are at pains to point out in their 2013 target article in, in Perspectives on Psychological Science is that there are really just some um, defining, uh, necessary and defining features that go along with type one or type two processing. Necessary and defining features. So when it comes to type two processing, the defining, the necessary and defining features there are really about uh, the sort of nature and functioning of that kind of reflective processing, really as embodying cognitive decoupling, uh, hypothetical thinking, and the role of mental simulation. So cognitive decoupling is very much this idea that you can hold multiple uh, models, if you like, in your mind, ones that reflect the state of reality, but ones that are more hypothetical or imaginary in nature. So Ruth talked extensively yesterday, for example, about counterfactual reasoning, um, how you develop a mental representation of a situation such as uh, if he'd have arrived at the airport on time, then he would have caught his plane. Um, the facts are that he didn't arrive at the airport port and didn't catch his plane, so that's the sort of reality. But you can also at the same time simultaneously uh, decouple from that and hold in your mind the idea that if he had got to the airport in time, then he would have been able to catch that flight. So that's very much cognitive decoupling. Uh, mental simulation, when you look at any aspect of higher cognition, you see mental simulation going on. So in one of my other areas of research, I'm very interested in design cognition, how designers design things, how architects design bridges, how um, engineers design um, mechanical systems. What you see there is mental simulation happening all of the time. So when you take think aloud protocols of designers designing, it's very much around if uh, what if kind of thinking. Uh, what if I change this component? What will the cause, what will the consequences of that causal change be? Uh, so it's very, very apparent that mental simulation is a core aspect of this sort of reflective thinking. And what Evans and Stanovich argue as well is that another necessary and defining feature of type two processing is this requirement for working memory resources. These processes of cognitive decoupling, hypothetical thinking, and mental simulation are really very highly working memory demanding. Then in contrast, when you look at type one processing, intuitive processing, it's really orthogonal on, on these uh, features. It's very much autonomous and mandatory in nature and does not require uh, working memory. So as I said, Evans and Stanovich are at pains to point out that these are the necessary and defining features of type one versus type two processing. All of these features in blue are features that they argue are correlated with type one or type two processing respectively. So if you look at the correlates of type one processing, yes, sort of fast, high capacity, parallel, non-conscious, bias responses, contextualized in nature, automatic, associative experience, based decision making, and independent of cognitive ability. And then on the other side, type two processes, reflective processes, slow, capacity limited, serial, conscious, etc. But the point is that these are not necessary and defining features. They are correlates that only appear under certain quite constrained situations. Um, and that is important because what we'll see in a second is that the criticisms that have been lodged against dual process theory uh, typically are lodged um, at these kind of correlated features rather than at the level of the defining features. Also, as Jonathan 
explained in his presentation, there's a, a close link between the distinction between type 1 and type 2 processing and the notion of sort of two systems, system 1 versus system 2, although Evans and Stanovich are dissociating themselves from the system, system 1 versus system 2 terminology in recent theorizing. But the idea is that the sort of system 1 um, encapsulates type 1 processing, system 2 encapsulates type 2 processes, system 1 being linked with the old mind, as Jonathan talked about, and system 2 with the new mind. The old mind being early evolved, the new mind being uh, evolving later in time, being distinctively human, uh, involving explicit uh, knowledge and complex emotions. So that's the framework I'll be sort of starting off with to talk about phenomena such as belief bias. Just let me uh, briefly go through some of the key debates around the viability of, of dual process theory that have been lodged really at that sort of received dual process model. Evans and Stanovich, uh, 2013, note that critics focus on very much on that sort of simplified received version of dual process theory in which all of the correlates of type 1 and type 2 processes are mistakenly assumed to be necessary and defining features. What that means is that that kind of oversimplification engenders really quite inappropriate criticisms of the viability of dual process theory. So, for example, you find in the writings of Krugolansky and Gigerenza that they argue that dual process theory is falsified because you can find evidence of non-alignment between features. So, for example, going back here, if you found um, fast but um, normative responding, fast but sort of accurate responding, Krugolinsky and Gigerenza would argue, well, that's showing sort of falsification of the dual process framework. Similarly, if you showed sort of slow but non-normative responding, they would argue that is a falsifying instance. Um, but that kind of argument really doesn't work if these uh, features in blue are really seen as not being necessary in defining, but are seen as being simple correlates of type 1 and type 2 processing. Um, in responding to um, Evans and Stanovich's uh, really clarification around this dual process framework and this notion of many of these features being simply correlates of type 1 and, two, type pro, type one and type 2 processing. Um, the critics have subsequently claimed that, well, dual process theory then becomes completely unfalsifiable because you've just got these kind of correlates in there. And really that isn't, I don't think, a fair criticism at all. Uh, for one, it's clear that Evans and Stanovich are saying that there are necessary and defining features of type 1 and type 2 processing, things like use of working memory, things like cognitive decoupling, mental simulation, and hypothetical thinking. So there are testable defining features there uh, that are more than just correlates. And then the other argument, I think, is that really um, when you look at more task-specific instantiations of the dual process framework, that's where you get to real testable assumptions that can be uh, falsified through empirical data collection. Um, as Evans and Stanovich argue, the critics are really attacking a kind of a framework, uh, a, a meta theory, if you like. And it's really not appropriate to criticize a theory at the framework or meta theory level you can only really lodge criticisms at the more detailed instantiation of the theory as specific process models of cognitive phenomena. Um, if you haven't encountered this particular debate before, um, I think it's well worth reading both the Evans and Stanovich target article, the 2013 target article in POPs, and then the four, um, uh, the, the, the four um, responses that are uh, published in the journal in response to that target article, and then the reply that Evans and Stanovich um, write as well. It's a nice sort of uh, narrative and gives you a real sense of the debate, the issues that are at stake, and 
this important distinction, I think, between uh, theory and meta-theory in dual processing. Let's move on then to think about belief bias as a particular paradigm case of dual processing that can, I will argue, lead to testable predictions uh, that can be open to falsification and that can allow for theoretical advancement. Um, we've helpfully seen um, a bit about belief bias already. By the end of the day, you'll be an expert on, on belief bias, believe me. Um, Belief bias occurs when a person's reasoning response is determined by the believability of a conclusion rather than by its logical validity. It's quite a restricted notion of belief bias. It's very much about arguments and conclusions and the believability of those conclusions, the logical validity or not of the argument. Um, typically, really for historical reasons, belief bias has been studied uh, in some quite specific areas that involve presenting logical arguments, syllogisms. Uh, the syllogisms that are frequently studied are categorical syllogisms. These are syllogisms that involve the quantified terms all, no, some, or some are not. Uh, and the examples I've presented there all contain the quantifiers um, all. So, for example, all flowers need water, all roses need water. The participant would be presented with a conclusion, such as, therefore, all roses are flowers. And as we've seen earlier, um, you can have syllogisms like this that are um, invalid, even though they have these highly believable conclusions, like all roses are flowers. You can also have syllogisms that have a valid conclusion that seems unbelievable, such as all boats have wheels from the premises, all vehicles have wheels, all boats are vehicles. Conclusion, all boats have wheels, seems unbelievable, but it is in fact valid. Um, so this is the standard kind of belief bias paradigm. Just relating back to an interesting point that was made yesterday um, about whether we're sort of looking at um, reckoning versus reasoning. Belief bias is fundamentally about reasoning. Uh, it falls really within the standard deduction paradigm in the sense that participants are given these kinds of syllogisms and are asked to assume the truth of the premises and then to reason out whether conclusions necessarily follow from the assumed truth of the premises. So the instructional set given along with these kinds of problems really emphasizes to participants that they need to engage in uh, deductive reasoning to work out whether conclusions necessarily follow or not. So fundamentally about reasoning. Um, I should say that there are some studies out there that have used things, arguments other than these kind of categorical syllogisms with terms like all know some and some are not. Um, there are some studies that have used um, uh, conditional syllogisms. So it might be if, flower, uh, if it's a flower then it needs water. If it's a rose then it needs water. Therefore, if it's a rose, it's a flower. So you can have um, uh, conditional versions of these kinds of syllogisms. Uh, there's a little bit of research that's, that's out there that's used sort of relational terms as well with these kinds of arguments. Uh, for example, you could have um, uh, a problem involving spatial re relations. It might be something like uh, Montreal is to the um, east of Saskatchewan. Um, Vancouver is to the west of Saskatchewan. Is it true or not, or is it necessarily the case that uh, Vancouver is to the west of Montreal? So you can see you can formulate these kinds of arguments with premises and conclusion, and you can manipulate the logical validity or not of the, of the conclusion. What you find with the ones involving sort of spatial knowledge and geographical knowledge is that students have no understanding of geography at all. So it's, it's kind of not worth running those kind of studies. Their geographical knowledge is it's just terrible. So we've already seen the way in which uh, the belief bias paradigm unfolds in, in some of the uh, earlier talks. Um, the, the beauty of the paradigm is you can manipulate uh, validity and believability uh, orthogonally to sort of fill these four cells so that you can have believable but valid uh, conclusions, you can have unbelievable valid conclusions, believable invalid conclusions, 
and unbelievable invalid conclusions. You can give these problems to participants, ask them to determine the uh, necessity or not of the conclusions that are presented and look at endorsement rates. So typically these studies look at whether people accept the conclusion or not. Um, those items are adapted from Denise and Franzen's um, reasonably simple uh, syllogistic arguments uh, that uh, produce interesting findings. The findings I'll show you first of all are the findings that derive from the Evans, Barston and Pollard 1983 study. We've already seen these data, although these are presented in a slightly different way uh, to what we saw earlier. Again, I must emphasize that these are percentage acceptance rates, so people endorsing the conclusion, the percentage of people endorsing the conclusion <coughs> as a function of uh, validity and believability. Um, for me, this is one of the most sort of fascinating patterns of data in reasoning research. Um, I started my undergraduate degree in 1983 at Plymouth University uh, with Jonathan Evans as a tutor and, and I remember him showcasing these data uh, in a lecture and talking through them and I was absolutely gripped uh, by how fascinating they were uh, and now 30 odd years on we're still trying to understand I think the, you know, why this pattern of data emerges. Let me talk you through it uh, briefly. Um, so what you find is you find a main effect of belief, and this is the belief bias effect. People tend to accept believable conclusions, 80%, tend not to accept unbelievable conclusions, 33%. If people were being logical, it would be a 50% in each of these cells. So there's a belief bias effect. People are driven towards accepting the believability, towards accepting believable conclusions and rejecting unbelievable ones. There's also a main effect of logic. So at the same time as people being belief biased, they're also to some extent logical, which is, is really quite fascinating and, and very much a dual process notion. People are being biased on the one hand, but also reasonably logical on the other hand. So if people were being completely logical, this is a valid row, you'd have 100% acceptance here. Well, you've got 72%, but people are tending towards accepting valid conclusions. If people were being completely logical, they would be rejecting all of these invalid ones. Well, they're not down at zero, they're at 40%. But you can clearly see that there is a main effect of validity, of logic there. Then you've also got this fascinating interaction between logic and belief. Um, so there are various ways to describe this interaction. One way is to say that, well, if you look at uh, the invalid problems, there's a big separation between the believables and the unbelievables, 71% versus 10%. So belief bias is having a big effect on the invalid problems. It's having a lesser, belief is having a lesser effect on the valid conclusions. The other way to think about the interaction is to say there's actually a large separation between validity and invalidity for the unbelievable conclusions that logic is having a bigger effect on unbelievable conclusions than on believable ones where there's not much of a separation. And indeed, those two different ways of interpreting the interaction between logic and belief have given rise to different theorizing in, in the literature. It's also worth briefly just sort of focusing in, I think, on the individual cells, because uh, they are quite interesting to get your head around. So if we look at the sort of um, the, the ones in blue at the moment, these are the cells that reflect the situation where logic and belief coincide. So we have believable conclusions that are valid, both driving you towards an acceptance decision, uh, which happens to be normatively correct, so a high acceptance rate here. And again, these are sort of no conflict problems where you have an unbelievable conclusion that's invalid driving you towards rejection of the conclusion, and indeed most people are rejecting the conclusion. So these are the no conflict items. Then if you look at the conflict items where logic and belief are putting in, put into opposition, it's quite fascinating. So these are invalid conclusions, and yet 71% of people are accepting, accepting them. It should, should be down at zero, uh, but this is the effect of belief again, driving forward the acceptance of these invalid but believable 
conclusions. And here, again, a conflict item, unbelievable, uh, but valid. Uh, some indication that people are uh, a little bit swayed by the validity, but uh, a, you know, they shouldn't really be rejecting these, but there's a tendency towards rejection as well. So fascinating pattern of, of data, absolutely intriguing. Uh, and what I want to do is go through some of these serial, sequential, parallel, and hybrid theories that uh, really work hard to try and interpret this pattern of endorsement rates, but we'll also see that some ev other evidence has, sort of, has crept into the picture as well, relating to things like processing times, um, neuroscientific evidence, uh, and the like, confidence data, uh, which um, really sort of build up a, a more uh, nuanced story about what's going on. Let's look at one historically important but now rather dated sequential dual process model of belief bias, the selective scrutiny model, again which Jonathan mentioned very briefly in his talk. Uh, it stems back to the Evans et al. paper in 1983. Um, and this uh, model is really about explaining the interaction in terms of why logic is having a bigger effect on unbelievable conclusions and unbelievable ones. So it's, it's one particular way of looking at that interaction that I mentioned. The idea here is that uh, if a conclusion is believable, then you just get a rapid intuitive response where people accept the believable conclusion. And people only do more reflective analytic work if the conclusion is unbelievable. And it's that greater kind of reflective analytic work that leads to um, the separation of unbelievable conclusions in terms of validity or invalidity, the bigger effect of validity on unbelievables. So the idea is that people then with unbelievable conclusions ask the question, well, is the conclusion necessitated by the premises? So it's kind of a logical question. Does a conclusion necessarily follow from the premises. If the answer is no, then you'll get conclusion rejection. If the answer is uh, yes, it's necessitated, the conclusion is necessi necessitated by the premises, you'll accept the conclusion. So you get more logical responding on these unbelievable conclusions. And there's a good idea, sort of evolutionary wise, as to why you might scrutinize unbelievable conclusions in more detail. I mean, the idea would be, for example, if somebody was discussing something with you or arguing with you and came out with an unbelievable kind of statement or conclusion that you didn't think followed, you might then want to scrutinize the soundness of their reasoning in order to see whether their unbelievable conclusion was defensible or not. Um, so I think it makes sense in terms of sort of psychological plausibility and evolutionary plausibility. Um, before I look at some, some data, I should say as well that there was a, a, an interesting follow-up model to the selective scrutiny model, model, which was developed by the mental model theorists in the 80s, uh, Johnson Laird, uh, Jane Oakhill, um, Alan Garnham. Very similar idea, um, subsequently dubbed a sort of a selective falsification model. Really, it, it's the same model but instantiated in mental models terminology. Uh, so the idea would be that if a conclusion was believable, then people would just try and construct a sort of a single mental model that um, supported the conclusion, the believable conclusion, which would be readily possible and would tend to accept uh, conclu believable conclusions. It would only be the unbelievable conclusions that would drive a sort of a search for counterexample models of the premises, alternative ways of representing the premises in order to determine whether the conclusion necessarily followed or not from those premises. So different terminology, mental models terminology, but very much the same idea and explaining the logic by belief interaction in the same kind of way uh, as a selective scrutiny model. These two early sequential dual process models of belief bias um, really lead to a very interesting prediction. And the prediction is quite a simple one. Because conclusions that are believable are driving forward this kind of rapid intuitive responding, people shouldn't take very long 
in responding to believable conclusions. It's only these unbelievable conclusions that are um, involving much more elaborate, reflective processing, counterexample search in the mental model theory in order to determine whether the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. So you have a basic chronometric time-based prediction. People should be quick when conclusions are believable. People should be slower when conclusions are unbelievable. And what I'll present to you here are some uh, data derived from an eye tracking study that looked at people's attentional processing when they were reasoning with belief-oriented syllogisms. Um, so all of these time-based data are in seconds. Um, we've got uh, believable, valids, believable, invalids, unbelievable, valids, unbelievable, invalids. So standard belief bias paradigm with people being presented with premises and a conclusion for each problem. But in this study, we were able to look at how long people looked at the premises, how, people lo how long people looked at the conclusion, how long people looked at the problem overall. We were also able to split the attentional processing on premises into um, two different types of processing, how long people were look looking at the premises before they actually looked at the conclusion, and how long people looked at the premises after they'd first seen the conclusion. So a pre-conclusion premise processing time and a post-conclusion premise processing time. We've got a total premise processing time here. We've got how long people were looking at the conclusions to each problem, and we've got an overall processing time measure down the bottom there. Now remember the prediction that I said derived from both the selective scrutiny model and the sort of selective falsification account, the mental model theory. It was that believable conclusions should be responded to quickly, unbelievable ones slowly. In fact, you're getting an opposite pattern here. You're getting slower responding to the believable conclusions and rather quicker responding to the unbelievable conclusions. So this is, in terms of predictive validity, this is a direct falsification, I would argue, of the mental model theory and the selective scrutiny model. Um, it's also interesting um, if you look at what's going on pre-conclusion and post-conclusion viewing time. Um, here, for example, are the pre-conclusion viewing times for the premises for the four different types of argument. You can see there's not much difference between the four arguments in terms of how long people are looking at the premises before they actually look at the conclusion. I guess that's kind of to be expected. They haven't seen the conclusion yet. They don't know whether it's believable or unbelievable. They're just perhaps trying to understand and represent the premises to, to some degree. What's interesting, though, is that when you look at the post-conclusion viewing time, now you're getting quite a separation in terms of the amount of time that people go back and look at the premises. And it's really these conflict items that are showing this increase in processing time. So these are the two con conflict items where logic and belief are in opposition. You've got a high time of 9.7 seconds here relative to the other times, 7.2 here. It suggests that there's something special about these conflict items. After people have seen the conclusion, they seem to be wanting to go back and do more work in terms of representing and understanding the premises. Indeed, if you look at the total processing time for these conflict syllogisms, they're tending towards being longer than for the non-conflict items. So it's an interesting pattern of data. First of all, you've got the falsification of the selective scrutiny model and the mental model theory, those sequential models. Uh, but then you've also got these kind of interesting time-based findings about more time being spent on the conflict items. I should say that... Um, the longer response time seen on believable items, especially on the invalid believable items, has also been independently found in, in an earlier study to this eye tracking study, actually, by Valerian Thompson and, and colleagues in 2003 in a subsequent uh, study published by them in 2011. 
Uh, so there's robust evidence out there that response times for believable conclusions tend to be longer than unbelievable ones. And there's kind of unique effect where invalid believable items uh, have the sort of longest processing time of all. In terms of an interim summary, then I'd say the selective scrutiny model and the mental model theory are, are not sustainable based upon those response time data. Um, I'd also say that the unique properties of the conflict items, especially those invalid believable ones, uh, really need to be taken seriously when developing sequential dual, dual process theories of belief bias, indeed any theories of dual process theories of belief bias. I should mention another uh, selective processing model as well uh, because it's historically important, uh, although I think, as we'll see, it's questionable whether the model can uh, accommodate the data both from endorsement rates and response times. This is the selective processing model uh, of Evans and colleagues, so distinct from the selective scrutiny model but embodying some similar kinds of notions uh, published in 2001. A uh, slightly technical model, and I'll try and talk you through it. The idea here is that the default intuitive heuristic response is to accept believable uh, conclusions and to reject unbelievable ones. So people have a kind of rapid intuitive default response, uh, which really explains the basic belief bias effect. Then the argument is that if analytic intervention happens, uh, it's limited in the sense that people just strive to construct a single representation of the premises, a single mental model, if you like, of the premises. But that kind of reflective, analytic search for a model of the premises is itself biased. So we see bias creeping into the analytic process here. And it's biased, that process is biased by the conclusion's believability. The argument here is that people will attempt to confirm a believable conclusion. They'll attempt to find a mental model that validates a believable conclusion, but they'll attempt to find a counterexample model, a model that refutes an unbelievable conclusion. It's quite technical, but it's an interesting idea and it's quite nuanced. In fact, it gives a different account of that interaction effect between logic and belief on endorsement rates. It's really looking at um, how um, belief can have a bigger effect on invalid conclusions than on valid ones. So it's a different interpretation of the interaction effect. If we think about the four different types of conclusions then, let's see how this model sort of plays out. Let's just think about valid conclusions that can either be believable or unbelievable. Because they're valid conclusions, there are only confirming models. There's no falsifying models at all. So if you have a valid, believable conclusion, you're driven towards trying to find a confirming model, you'll find one. You'll probably find one relatively quickly as well. If you're looking for, and you'll, you'll accept the valid conclusion, you'll respond normatively. If you've got a valid but unbelievable conclusion, with the unbelievable conclusion, you'll look for a falsifying model. You'll look to try and sort of disprove the conclusion. But there are no falsifying models because it's a valid conclusion. So you might search for a falsifying model, you won't find one, so you'll tend to, at the end of the day, accept those unbelievable conclusions as being valid. So less of an impact of belief on the valid conclusions. When you look at the invalid conclusions, on the other hand, this is where you see in the, day, in the endorsement data quite a separation between invalid believables and invalid unbelievables. Invalid conclusions are essentially indeterminate. There are both confirming models and falsifying models that you can find um, when you search for them. So the idea is that with invalid conclusions, if they're believable, um, so invalid but believable, you look for a confirming model and you'll find one. Uh, so you'll tend to accept, incorrectly accept, an invalid but believable conclusion. If you have an invalid but un unbelievable conclusion, you'll look for a falsifying model because it's unbelievable, and you'll find one. Um, so therefore, you'll tend to reject, correctly reject these invalid unbelievables. So in this way, with uh, 
invalid conclusions, you get strong separation between believability and unbelievability, which explains the interaction effect that you see endorsement in endorsement rates. It's quite technical, but it's a really interesting nuanced uh, account of the logic by belief interaction. It still leads to the question about these response time effects. Why do conflict items show increased processing times relative to the no conflict items? Surely, according to this model, then some element of time consuming, reflective, analytic processing should be equally likely for all problem types, whatever their conclusion status. You're engaging in this model search for either a confirming model or a falsifying model. You're looking for a single model that either confirms or falsifies. Surely that should take about the same amount of time across all problem types. So how do you explain this increased processing time that you see with conflict items, particularly with the invalid believable conflict items? Um, well, one argument is that analytic intervention, uh, and this is a default interventionist model, sequential model, analytic intervention on the default response could well differ across individuals because of individual differences in cognitive ability, uh, mind wear if you like, uh, working memory capacity, or in terms of dispositions and motivations to engage in reflective reasoning. Uh, so just to capture that in a, a model adapted from Evans 2011, uh, Evans's general default interventionist model, sequential model of reasoning, the idea is that you have an intuitive type 1 process that starts off to give you an intuitive A1 default response and then you engage in re reflective processing. Uh, but what determines whether you engage in reflective processing and the extent of reflective processing that you engage in is determined by motivational factors and cognitive resources. So motivational factors might be things like instructions that are given to you. It might be things like your disposition to engage in reflective reasoning, need for cognition, things like actively open-minded thinking, uh, your desire to sort of riddle out solutions to problems, uh, feeling of rightness, which I'll talk about in a minute, FOR, uh, which is this sort of gut feel as to whether you think you've derived a sort of an intuitive response that sort of feels right or not to the problem. These can all determine how you set the degree of critical effort, analytic effort that you will apply to potentially overturn the intuitive A1 response. Similarly, cognitive resources will impact upon that decision to engage in more and how much more reflective reasoning. Cognitive resources such as working memory capacity that I've mentioned uh, competing tasks, whether there's a sort of secondary task or distracting influences in the environment, things like the amount of time available that you have to engage in reflective thinking. So this is the basic default interventionist model. And what I, I, I'm trying to argue is that there are parameters that you can introduce, such as ones around motivational factors and cognitive resources that might be able to explain the longer processing times for the conflict items within the basic selective processing model of belief bias. Really, I'm arguing for the need to add in auxiliary assumptions to the selective processing model in order to try and capture those processing time effects. And indeed, this is what um, we did in a study with, with Jonathan, um, Ed Stuppel, and um, an undergraduate student, um, Camel Smith, in 2011. We um, aim to explore the selective processing model, but from an individual differences perspective, building in auxiliary assumptions about the way in, different, the way in which different types of reasons might engage in more or less reflective processing that could um, actually help us to understand why we were getting these longer processing times with conflict items. The basic argument is that perhaps these long latencies uh, in aggregate data for the conflict items reflect the longer processing times taken by a subset of individuals 
whose reasoning involves more time-consuming analytic thinking. So people who are more motivated to reason or people who are more able to reason uh, will take presumably longer over the process and maybe that gives you the increasing processing time that we see for the conflict items. And indeed, along that line of reasoning, Stoppel et al. 2011 provided supporting evidence for that very, propos very proposal that what aggregate do data are doing is they're masking the effects of these different sort of ability groups of reasoners. Let me, let me show you the data and, and try and clarify what's going on. So what I've got here are, is a graph showing uh, mean response times in seconds for three different ability groups of reasoners. What we did is we simply divided our reasoners into three groups that reflected how well they were doing on these belief-oriented reasoning problems. So we had a low logic group who were getting less than 50% of the items correct. Uh, in contrast with our high logic group who were getting greater than 75% of the problems correct. And in the middle we've got our medium logic group somewhere between 50 and 75% of the items correct. So a simple sort of split of the data into these three ability groups. And then we've got uh, response times, mean response times for each of the four different types of items. Valid believables, uh, the conflict items in the middle, valid unbelievables, and invalid believables, and then another non-conflict problem here, invalid unbelievables, the same for each group. So let's think about the low logic group. These people are responding quite quickly to the problems. It looks pretty much like they're responding intuitively, um, quickly, not doing much reasoning. Um, therefore, we're seeing, when you look at the, the endorsement data, you see high belief bias, but quick responding. The high logic group, on the other hand, are taking longer over all the problems, seemingly engaging in more reflective reasoning. I'm trying not to commit the sort of uh, fallacy that, that Evans talked about, but these high logic people are, are taking longer, presumably engaged in more analytic processing. Um, and when you look at their response data, they're generally, as I said, doing well at these problems, getting 75% or more correct. And then the medium logic group really showing pattern in between, um, getting um, between 50 and 75% of the problems right, really being very well captured, I would say, by the selective processing model. Uh, when you look at their data pattern, it's very much like what you'd predict from the selective processing model. I think what's very interesting then is what you're seeing with the conflict items. You're seeing this very long processing latency, especially in this high logic group, for these invalid but believable items. Really attesting to the fact that what seems to be going on is the aggregate data in terms of response times are masking um, a rather nuanced effect that relates to different ability groups. Uh, yes, you're seeing again to some extent with the medium logic people, the medium ability people, you're seeing some effect of these invalid believable items, these conflict items taking longer to process. Um, What's kind of fascinating is um, when you look at the low logic group, remember the conflict items of the middle two bars, when you actually do the statistics, this low logic group is also showing some sensitivity to the logical properties of the problem. So I've said that they're highly belief biased and they're responding relatively quickly and yet they are showing some increased latencies for the conflict items relative to the no conflict items which is uh, an absolutely intriguing finding. So they're, they're not responding normatively, uh, and yet there is this kind of hint of sensitivity to normative considerations. They seem to be aware that there's a conflict between logic and belief on those conflict items, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So let me just summarize the sequential models of um, belief bias uh, before moving rapidly through parallel process models and finishing off uh, with, with hybrid accounts. Early models are effective at explaining uh, endorsement rates, but I'd say not response times. The more recent selective processing model explains most of the data, uh, including individual differences in response times if you add in auxiliary assumptions. One curious finding is that these low ability reasoners seem to be sensitive 
to logic belief conflicts despite responding to these items intuitively since we've seen that the decisional agencies are significantly uh, slower compared with the no conflict items. That's really a key conundrum uh, as Danae's 2012 has noted. If intuitive processing precedes reflective processing then there's really no mechanism for the reasoners to detect that a conflict between intuitive and reflective processes has happened until both of the sorts of processes have run their course. Uh, it's a really interesting conundrum. So what is going on with these low ability reasoners that's allowing them to detect the conflict between logic and belief? I'll come back to it, but let's just uh, really go through a few slides that look at parallel dual process models um, as exemplified by the work of Sloman. So this is where we have two parallel streams of processing working concurrently the intuitive stream and the reflective stream ha happening at the same time to generate their own individual response. Conflict therefore arises when the two processing streams produce different responses such that conflict resolution is then necessary. So the intuitive response will have generated one belief-oriented belief -oriented response. The analytic process, process running concurrently has generated a different response. You get a conflict that needs to be resolved conflict resolution will take time that will increase latencies for conflict items versus no conflict items so that would explain that interesting reaction time effect overall the conflict items are taking longer than no conflict items um, and it would explain it for all kinds of uh, ability differences if we look at the evidence uh, the models assume that people have some awareness of belief logic conflicts. The two processing streams produce a conflicting result. You would have some kind of awareness of that conflict. And that assumption does align with evidence that people have reduced confidence in conflict items relative to no conflict items. If you take confidence measures, people are less confident in the conflict items and their responses to them. Confidence reduction also seems to manifest in increased autonomic arousal. So for conflict items, you can also take people's skin conductance responses. And again, it suggests that people are having an emotional reaction um, to the conflict, um, even though they might be responding non-normatively. Uh, autonomic responses are picking up conflict. I think the main problem with the parallel models is that they have real conceptual difficulties. First of all, as I've shown, the latency effect for complex items, complex items is asymmetrical. It really is most dominant for the invalid believable items. Um, the parallel process models that's currently instantiated can't really explain that asymmetry. They might be able to do with some auxiliary assumptions. I think what's more strange for these models is that you have to have a decision system in the model that really waits for the results of the two processing streams before producing a final response. And that just seems cumbersome. Uh, if you think about it in terms of a horse race, the slower um, stream um, you know, has to be waited for. The, the fast stream operates quickly, and yet the fast stream can't produce its response until the, the slow horse has, has run its course. That just seems cumbersome for all kinds of theoretical and evolutionary reasons. It generally seems inefficient as well to compute a reflective, normative, analytic response only then to have it potentially overturned or challenged by the intuitive response. It really doesn't seem to make sense as a model uh, in conceptual terms. So the models seem to be cognitively inefficient, evolu evolutionarily maladaptive. And there's an interesting point that Denise makes in 2012, which is that it would be much more efficient for the cognitive systems to determine whether reflective thinking might be helpful for reasoning without actually having first to engage in that re reflective processing um, in order to inform that decision. It's, it's a subtle point, but it's a really nice one. It'd be good to have some kind of mechanism that could tell you whether you needed to do some more reflective processing. Such a mechanism, if we had one, would be really maximally adaptive in terms of the efficient deployment of cognitive resources, absolutely when they're most needed. And this is where I'll move towards finishing off by looking at belief bias with hybrid dual process models that involve parallel processing 
and sequential processing assumptions, really as exemplified by uh, Danese's interesting work. We now have a, a growing body of converging evidence from response times, from confidence ratings, from neuroscientific signatures, neural signatures from auto autonomic um, markers that suggest that people are responsive, sensitive to the normative principles um, associated with problems, even when they respond intuitively, quickly, and non-normatively. Uh, and that, that is fascinating. And I think we really have to recognize that that evidence is out there. But then what's the best way to conceive of that normative knowledge that allows for the detection of, say, logic belief conflicts in the belief bias paradigm? Denise argues that normative sensitivity is, in fact, entirely intuitive, implicit, and automatically activated. So this sensitivity to normative considerations happens at an intuitive level, um, at a, a, a rapid, implicit, intuitive level. And he presents, Denise presents the logical intuition model with time running along the x-axis, with the white bars reflecting intuitive processing, the gray bar reflecting deliberative reflective processing. And you see what we have is we have two types of intuitive processing. We have heuristic intuitive processing and we have logical intuitive processing. And really you only move on to deliberative processing if there's a conflict between the outputs of the intuitive heuristic and the intuitive logical processing. There's a kind of a trigger or switch that then moves you on to more deliberative processing. So this really captures the idea that with conflict belief logic items, you get this intuitive conflict between the logic of the problem, between normative considerations and between the heuristically derived beliefs. And that conflict can then trigger more analytic processing that may or may not lead you to the, the normative um, solution, but will take time, um, therefore explaining the time difference that you get with uh, the conflict items. So that's neat. If we look at the strengths of the logical intuition model, uh, it really captures a lot of the data from convergent methods, as, as I've argued. Um, it's also been generalized way beyond the belief bias paradigm to other um, paradigms, including base rate neglect, racial bias, the cognitive reflection test, as we heard a little bit about earlier in Jonathan's talk and uh, conjunction fallacy problems as well. So it's got broad generalizability. It also aligns very nicely with developmental data, uh, which I think Vim will talk about later, um, which suggests that children, even pre-verbal infants, seem to have an intuitive grasp of normative principles. Um, nice work from Valerie Rayner's lab and from uh, Teglas Girotto, Gonzalez Bernati, there showing that pre-verbal infants uh, seem to detect normative violations. The model also connects well with findings uh, from the uh, literature on metacognition and reasoning, meta-reasoning, which I know Valerie Thompson will be talking about extensively later. Um, and I'll just, just run through a few key points there, uh, really before finishing off, because I think the, the meta-reasoning literature really does align very closely with the logical intuition model and sort of speaks strongly to it. Meta-reasoning is really about uh, all the processes and mechanisms that control and regulate our reasoning, things that are, you know, enable us to set goals, to determine how much time we're going to spend on problems, to determine what strategies we're going to use, uh, to determine when to terminate reasoning and, and give up or generate a response. Um, those kind of regulation decisions seem to be determined by experience to some extent, familiarity with similar problems, but also important processing cues within the problem itself or related to your processing of the problem. Things like the coherence of the information, the elements within the problem, as exemplified in the work of Sasha Topolinsky. Things like the ease of mental representation of the problem. Um, they seem, the ease of mental representation seems to be important in determining um, how much effort you'll put into the problem. And especially important, I think, is the fluency with which a solution an intuitive solution comes to mind, uh, which Valerie argues uh, very persuasively gives rise to a feeling of rightness about the solution. That fluency, that ease of processing gives rise to a feeling of rightness. And feeling of rightness can then act as a metacognitive trigger, a switch, if you like, in Denae's terminology that can uh, 
uh, push you on to more reflective processing when feeling of rightness is low. Um, so interesting ideas that align very closely with the logical intuition model. Importantly, I think the limitations at the moment of the model is that we need to explore the boundary conditions. To date, it's really been applied within the belief bias paradigm to quite simplistic um, syllogisms, ones that are um, at the simpler end of the complexity spectrum. One problems that we know from, for example, Johnson, Led, and Burns' work that people tend to do well at when the problems are presented in their abstract form. So you get generally normative responding. So I think we need to generalize the account to more complex syllogistic arguments. Um, although it is worth noting that in some of the earlier work I did uh, with, with Ed Stuckel, for example, uh, we've always used very complex syllogisms, uh, very much going back to the Evans et al. 1983 ones that are hard for participants. And even there, we find the kind of support that you'd expect for the logical intuition model, especially in terms of inspection times and, and processing times. Um, the model, the logical intuition model, is, I would argue, testable, um, although its scope still needs to be determined. And I think Vim Denais and Jean-Francois Bonifant would, would argue that that is the case. They completely accept that these boundary conditions need to ex be explored. And I think we need to be um, aware of the interesting point that Singman et al. Uh, mentioned, which is that the logical intuition model is kind of counterintuitive in some ways, because it argues that we have this kind of logical, intuitive ability. They, Singman et al. say it's an extraordinary claim in some ways, and that extraordinary claims really require very rigorous scientific uh, examination. And I think we, we, we'd all agree with that. To finish off then, uh, serial process models, some have definitely been falsified, I would argue, by the response time evidence. Other dual process theories that are sequential in nature seem to handle most of the data, such as the selective processing model, um, but at the expense of having to rely on auxiliary assumptions uh, being added into the model around cognitive ability and motivational factors, um, which really adds degrees of freedom and parameters um, and therefore starts to question the falsifiability of the model. Parallel dual process theories, I've argued, are conceptually inadequate and fall foul of kind of uh, considerations around cognitive efficiency and psychological plausibility. And therefore, for me, I'm increasingly persuaded, I would say, by the sort of hybrid approach of Denise and colleagues, the logical intuition model which has the beauty of explaining a lot of data, a lot of converging data, and also extending beyond belief bias to, to many other paradigms. Uh, thank you.